meeting's being recorded for anyone who wanted to know. Uh, and so uh, all the brilliance that we're uh, talking about today will be able to be recorded on the internet forever. You can come back and, and listen to it uh, at your heart's content. I know I certainly will. Uh, I wanted to uh, introduce the topic today, emerging security strategies. We're going to be talking about uh, the threats that really define both the physical and the cyber security landscape. And we have uh, three very capable uh, panelists with us today who are domain experts in this specific topic. And so uh, I'm going to have them each introduce themselves. Uh, and uh, we'll start with uh, George, then Robert, and then Navdeep. Uh, if you could please introduce yourselves. Thanks very much, James. Hello, everyone. My name is George Pentink. I'm the Director of Product Management at Cisco Meraki. And my domain is what is IO, uh, well, IoT, but uh, as I tell my sales team, no one is out there buying IoT. They're actually trying to do other things where types of technology can help them out. So more specifically, it's uh, cameras, smart cameras used for physical security and other things, along with uh, sensors for environmental monitoring as of today. Uh, so with that, I think I'm handing over to Robert. Great, hi everybody, I'm Rob Martins. Uh, I lead innovation and design, um, as well as the venture fund at Allegion. So you're probably not familiar with the name Allegion. Um, we make Schlage locks, Von Duprin door hardware, LCN closers and a bunch of things that um, help you uh, get in and out of the door. Um, so very excited to uh, to join the uh, the group today. This should be a great conversation, and I will throw it to Navdeep. Navdeep, you are muted. There we go. <laughs> So this is Navdeep Jawhar. I'm a director for Internet of Things in uh, Convergent Technologies. I'm a company's representative for digitization, which includes uh, all the cutting edge technologies, including IoT, AI, cloud, edge, and convert cybersecurity. I bring uh, to the table uh, more than 25 years of experience uh, in the adjacencies and the IoT world. Uh, and for the company, I'm identifying the gaps quickly and gaining momentum, creating new ecosystem of partners. And I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Abdeep. And uh, finally, I'm James Siegel. I'm moderating this panel, and uh, I'm the president and co-founder of OpenPath. We make physical access control systems. So instead of using a key card or a fob to unlock the door to your office, you can now use your mobile phone. Our technology is entirely cloud-based. And uh, what I love about this panel is that we are uh, tightly integrated with the Legion wireless lock, the Schley wireless lock solutions. Uh, we are tightly integrated with the Cisco Meraki video surveillance uh, technology and camera technology. And one of our premier partners who deploys and installs all of our combined technology is Convergent. So uh, we have some really knowledgeable folks here who understand uh, the convergence that's happening right now between physical and cybersecurity and can talk to it. So the, the five sort of uh, or six topics that we're going to be covering today are a lot of the challenges and shortcomings that we all face as we think about uh, the security landscape, both physical and cyber threats and vulnerabilities that are exposed uh, and that we try to sort of mitigate through both technology and process. Uh, there's a lot of interdependencies associated with how you marry your physical and your cybersecurity strategies together, and we'll talk through some of those best practices. And then, you know, what do you think about when you're putting your security strategy together in terms of mapping out a uh, process procedure and plan and doing so in a way that allows you to combine many of the legacy systems that you might already have invested in with some of the newer technology that you might be looking at. Uh, and finally, there's this value proposition associated with the cloud and with mobile and how the latest technologies, whether it's using artificial intelligence uh, using uh, analytic overlays to many of the legacy tech that you might already have, as well as cloud and mobile, can help improve your security posture and really stead you well for what it, both we can anticipate and what we can't anticipate in terms of future vulnerabilities and security exposures. So uh, there's also an opportunity in the Q&A section for you to enter questions that you might have that you want us to answer. Um, we've already had a pre-discussion about Peloton and what our various racing techniques are, so feel free to ask about that uh, or, you know, what our average, you know, minute per mile is, all of which we're comfortable talking about. Uh, all right, so let's move on to the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit here 
uh, and I'm going to sort of throw it out uh, to uh, really sort of the, the security landscape from an IT perspective. Um, there's a lot of network vulnerabilities that come into play both in the physical landscape of how you deploy technology and also uh, come into play in terms of how you connect all of your various systems together. So I'm going to throw it over to George to kind of start out here. And maybe we can talk about it holistically as you think about um, the cybersecurity challenges associated with connecting all of your physical security technology together. What are some of the sort of puts and takes that you think about uh, from the Meraki perspective? I think the this is very interesting field, and I think one of it is one of the significant parts of it is the. IT tools or technologies that physical security professionals are now using are radically different from where they were 10 years ago. And as someone who has worked in the uh, communications industry uh, for a little while, just as I sort of entered uh, the world of work, I worked for a company called Nortel, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, a uh, competitor to Cisco that has fallen by the wayside. But in my uh, my job there, I worked on IP telephony, and I was at the sort of tail end of this digital to IP telephony um, transition. And so you had digital phones, which had specific wiring. You had these uh, telephone systems in the basement that were owned by like facilities people and buildings people, uh, and it was it was dedicated to doing just that. And eventually, it became an application on the network. It went on x86 servers. It's spoke IP, it spoke open standards like SIP, but now, yeah, it's managed by IT. And the facilities people that previously owned telephony don't anymore. And I see the same sort of thing happening when I talk to customers in the physical security space, where with cameras, you've got people moving from like analog camera systems and sort of proprietary uh, door access systems, and it's converging onto the network if they're talking IP. But the people using these tools aren't necessarily the best place to make decisions about what technology to, to use. It's an application they need to do their physical security job. They don't necessarily know about encryption or a lot of the good security practices IT professionals understand. They understand the security best practices of how to prevent people like putting cards through doors and like jimmying locks open or, or whatever that is, which I'm not an expert on. Uh, and so we often see this problem where physical security professionals are, uh, are not supported uh, because their colleagues in IT may not know in making the decisions and, and they make decisions which look fine to them, but from an IT perspective are quite scary. And I'll share one anecdote from an unnamed customer that suddenly realized that they had a, um, a recording server for the cameras. Uh, that was connected on one side to a network no one knew existed uh, with 4,000 switches located across the country that IT had never bought. And the only thing that was protecting that network from talking to their really sensitive network was the video recording server, which wasn't managed by IT. Uh, it was like an unloved Windows XP machine <laughs> with hard disks in. So you can see the scale and the scary nature of the problem as an IT professional is, is really, really significant. And you need to sort of have this interdisciplinary physical security and cybersecurity approach, not just in like from the external perspective, but from the managing the infrastructure perspective. And this is going to become more and more common as we see people moving to like this newer technology and away from the analog technology. So, you know, uh, Navdeep, that makes me uh, worry a lot that IoT technology, the Internet of Thing edge devices that we have out there, and all this great you know gear that connects and interconnects, has kind of gotten a bad rap. Uh, may, may, mostly because maybe people are not thinking about the vulnerabilities that they create when they install really cool tech. Uh, you know, certainly to George's point. But as you go in and you know consultatively think with customers about their physical security and tying it into their cybersecurity. How do you approach that? Because obviously you don't want to offend and upset this prospective customer or existing customer, but you also kind of want to, you know, open up and see, all right, do you have some vulnerabilities here that you weren't aware of, like that network server uh, or that, sorry, that recording server that George was talking about? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great uh, question, James. Uh, we, we are, as a system integrator, uh, we are seeing a lot of these new uh, footprints coming coming to us 
And as we enter the world of solutions, it is becoming more and more complex. Right? There are various pieces which we have to put together. And what we are seeing from this perspective is that the emergence of IT-driven visual intelligence with cloud-based physical and digital security is very important for us. And then we also massage the location intelligence along with it. But as a, as a system integrator, on the, as a last mile runner, branding of solution is very important for us. Uh, there are multiple partners involved, customers can get confused, and they need to know sometimes what, who is the one point of contact, which is the best partner, best technology. So they, like for example, they want one program manager and you know one lead, et cetera. So we very much at Convergent Technologies, we offer a very programmatic approach to all this. We always go there as a neutral custodian and understand the customer pain point, then we create the solution. But we, at the same time, are very much aware that important platforms like from OpenPath and visual intelligence, which is being offered by Meraki, how we can bring both the pieces together and add location intelligence over the top of it to solve the customer, customer problems, right? We do pack the technology, services, software, and hardware, and then we bake the solution, right? But there is a, always a path which we take of simplicity and understanding the customer pain point from the edge, and then we move backwards to create the solutions. So do you have to do an audit when you first go in? Like, do you have to sort of say, okay, look, how, how bad or good is it, right, before I get in here, uh, and then sort of take it from there, or is it, do you even have an opportunity to do that? Yeah, so uh, James, that's a great concern, uh, a valid concern, what we also see. So at Convergent, uh, no doubt we are bringing the new new footprint and new branding, and we are going wider and deeper beyond video analytics access control. So when we go into an account, it really depends upon which industrial vertical we are dealing with. Every industrial vertical is different. Like take an example of manufacturing vertical where we understand the pain point from a non-IT guy on the factory floor, that that's the real pain point which this person is feeling from the customer side. And then we just see what type of infrastructure is already there. We don't have an approach of ripping, ripping it off all the way. We always take the best common denominator and educate the customer that this is the best approach we can uh, have. This is the best architecture we can offer you to solve this pain point. And then we bring the certified partners like OpenPath Meraki along our way to create the solution. Gotcha. And by the way, uh, George and Rod, feel free to jump in if there's comments or thoughts that you want to make without me uh, hitting you up. But um, I guess as I think about uh, a diversified enterprise that has manufacturing, offices, uh, R&D, I think about Allegiant just because, you know, we, we work so closely together and you guys have so many different uh, operational challenges as a company to protect and secure all of your IP, your people, your factories and, and the like. Um, do you run into this headache of, okay, you've got all these disparate systems deployed within your own company. Clearly you make physical security systems, you make locking solutions, you make a lot of this, but how do you think about it as both an owner and operator of your own, uh, you know, security infrastructure and someone who sells it? Yeah, it's, it, it's a great question. And the truth is sometimes it's hard to eat your own dog food. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, thinking about George's comment and Navdeep's too, you know, you're talking about a, a, an area where, let's just say for argument's sake, the vast majority of perimeters, for example, of commercial buildings are now uh, covered. They may have some form of electronic outside and some other pieces, but how does that play off with all of the other elements that you just described, James? So, um, and how do you also do that when you have a great deal of disruption and innovation within this, you know, industrial IOT space um, where not everybody is paying attention to what the proper standards are, or they may have some proprietary standard for a variety of reasons that benefits them and then makes it particularly difficult for Navdeep and his team or um, a, a owner operator to integrate things properly. So our approach, um, we try to be consistent both as a um, you know, provider um, we try to be the partner of choice within the space and as being a partner of choice, it's about um, having open platforms um, and tra being transparent with your APIs, your technology and anything that you have um, as when you look at, 
you know, these four companies stacked on top of each other on your screen here, um, you're only strong as your weakest link. Um, you know, whether that's from a cyber standpoint or from a physical standpoint. So when we think about IoT devices or we think about complex environments, I boil it down to three simple things. Um, and every element within it must cover these. Number one is security. So that's physical and digital security. Number two is scalability. So we're talking about, hey, how many times, for example, can that lever or reader or whatever it is work before it breaks? Um, and then the digital uh, scalability, does it behave the same way with 5,000 users or 500,000 users that it did with 500? And then last but not least, simplicity. And simplicity is in this case that we're talking about, it's not just a simple user interface with the end consumer, both physically, hey, I know how to use these things, and digitally, hey, this is a great interface, but it's also what's the developer experience like if I wanna integrate it with other things. So we're trying to eat our own dog food. Um, it's a frothy space and we should all be thankful for that. Um, because there's great opportunities here for uh, productivity, both digital productivity and physical productivity for people that are implementing these new technologies. And again, kind of referring back to what George said, we're still living in a time where the physical security guys didn't necessarily know that CIO. And as they're getting together, there's a great opportunity here to cross train and to really create the hybrids that are needed to work with Convergent, with OpenPath, Cisco and Allegiant to get, you know, great implementations done. And I think this conversation we're having around making sure there is standards-based API integration on platforms you invest in is really important to enable this hybrid security space because the reason we have been excited to work with uh, James and the team at OpenPath is that's what we wanted. We didn't want to build some proprietary only works with this vendor that has been around for 30 years type of approach um, because our cloud centric uh, camera architecture was designed to be like a step forward to reduce the infrastructure complexity and cost. And in doing so, you can actually make it more secure because complexity leads to insecurity. But they add value. It's not just about integrating them because that's cool. It's because when you have video and you have things like door access events and you have other inputs from IoT systems, you can answer questions much more easily, which were typically confusing. Like, you know, the door was open, but was that a valid event? Like, was that the right person? Like, were they taking something out of the building? Like having video context for that is really useful. And then if you have a very noisy environment for cameras where things like machine learning to detect people or motion detection, there's loads of people walking past that door, for example, it's like a hard technology to make work for your need. Then like very specific things like door um, open sensors or door forced open and the things that you can get from access control system make the camera data more valuable. So tying these data sets together, you can see in other parts of the IT space is, is something that people have been trying to do for some time. And I think it's one of the things that we as technologists owe to the physical security uh, decision makers to help explain what the potential is when they look at a, a more modern approach to deploying these type of systems. So I think it's fair to say too, one last thing is there's always going to be a balance between convenience and security. Um, you know, and, and that integration that George was just talking about is super critical to allowing you to have more decisions as a facility owner. It's, you know, more and more about the data and things like that, but it's also how much do you want to lock down versus how convenient do you want to be? There's a continuum there. And I think the flexibility, you know, can be provided um, and also with the guidance and advisory of a convergent uh, with Nabeek's team and other people to help you understand what your real options are so you can customize your workplace, um, you know, for yourself. That That is the, you know, end goal for a lot of these pieces is to put the control back in the hands of the owner um, rather than kind of taking whatever it is that's been given. Uh, and I think there's some real 
uh, importance behind the, the value of the partners like Convergent and Navdeep and team, because my experience has been there can be some skepticism, shall we say, from the traditional physical security elements in larger organizations that this is their space and like IT shouldn't really come play here. But they are coming together as we've talked about and having an in, independent like external entity bring best practices and their experience with other customers into the conversation and like talk about how they have all of these options and you can pick some or all of them is important to helping bridge that gap um, because it can it can be a challenge and, and that's what I've seen. And let's move to the next slide just because I wanted to, to focus on one of the points that you guys brought up, which is this idea of noise in that all of our systems uh, create a tremendous amount of noise for the security professionals at the, the, the institutional organization that we're protecting. Um, you know, I think uh, Allegiant, for instance, is uh, focused on not just the perimeter, right, but securing all the interior doors. Think about, you know, Meraki putting video anywhere uh, which you want it, and they've got a new camera that literally is so flexible that you can pop it literally on the uh, on a top of a shelf or on your desk or anywhere. And so, you know, the expansion of the data is getting a little overwhelming. And I guess maybe, you know, I'll start with sort of net deep. How do you mitigate the noise impact so that you can get down to really where the security threats are? And how do you expose the vulnerabilities that all this data is providing? What kind of advice and recommendations do you give your, your clients in that respect? Absolutely. This is, a, again, a very valid concern with our customers. Uh, so we take a very uh, unique approach uh, that when we see a remote location and federated sites, like for oil and gas, or utilities, substations, right? First step is to shield and protect. Like we shield them, we shield the devices while making their data accessible. That is the first point where we gain the customer's confidence uh, to, towards our side. And then we validate ensuring that we are bringing a sensible data which the system knows what to do with, right? We, are, we don't plumb the, everything and then we don't transfer all the data to the cloud or to the applications. Uh, we cherry pick, and then and then the next step is ingestion. Like bring that data into the system that operates and already, you know, with, which can be used, and where stakeholders are comfortable. Because making dashboards is easy, you know, dashboard is like a snowflake. But what really is the value as per the customer pain point? What you want to show, and last but not least is expose factor, which means to allow that data to be manipulated and analyzed. Right. And, you know, James, the main issue, what we are seeing is, you know, data is a connective tissue in all the industrial processes and data can set you free if you play your game correctly. Right. For example, we are talking about the edge. We are talking about the cloud. It's reality that only 65% of the companies have cloud first strategy because there are some hardcore things, which are not, which are like real challenges on the edge. For example, the three basic problems at the edge, what we are seeing is latency for real time insights, bandwidth constraints in the uplink directions, like, and also the data processing on prem, right? So when we deal with all these, uh, you know, problems, we understand the customer pain points. We say that, you know, we educate the customer that I, we, under, we know that your data is sensitive. We are going to work with you as a neutral data custodian, and we will only transfer the data which is required securely, right? And then even if we take the data to the cloud with the help of open path, you know, we exactly know how to deal with the cloud companies, right? Because cloud companies, they will work on the security within the cloud, but outside the cloud customer is responsible where we help our customers, right? And then we bring into the things like mission critical elements, the security elements, the health monitoring side on the IoT and the physical side focus. So we we make the system and the architecture in a way that we reduce the threat not only from outside, but like plugging holes, but also workflow for the inside threats. Right. That is how we mitigate the problems of the cybersecurity and the connectivity issues, because IoT devices and sensors, they are they are very much vulnerable to all type of threats. And there's one one thing I wanted to bring up because we're going to talk about this a lot and we already have talked about it a fair bit, which is cloud. Um, I just, having been part of the cloud industry for 
probably uh, come up for 10 years now in my time at Meraki, it's a means to an end. Like don't go cloud because cloud is cool. Go to a service from the cloud because it is more adaptable to your business as things change, it's lower cost. And because natively it's going to be running over untrusted networks, you have to implement good security practices. You can't trust that it's going to be on a network that's hidden behind things which are safe, like a firewall that you think is fully robust. So the cloud is just this really useful tool. It's like a Swiss army knife of being able to configure and manage lots of things, especially things that are remote. And that definitely falls into the category of things like uh, cameras, IoT systems, access control systems, and so on. Uh, I do want to just repeat what James said earlier, which is we do have a Q&A section and we'd love to go through your questions live if you send them in. So uh, I, I haven't seen any just yet, but do put them in and we'll try and go through. I was just going to there add, there's a, um, the, as a recovering CIO, I was a CIO for about 12 years. And I think, you know, specific to the slide that we have up and talking about cyber attacks, data breaches and other things is the CIO you know, has the purpose order, you know, delivered to them uh, from the sourcing organization because somewhere on it, it said digital. Um, it's really important to start to cross reference um, terminology, uh, information and, and other things so that we're educating the new decision makers um, with also understanding the absolute necessities of the um, physical requirements. So I just want to give a, a, a quick example. So I have people ask me all the time because I'm responsible for the industrial design function at Allegion. Why don't you just get me um, an exterior lock without a key? I'm going to use my phone. I'm going to use something else. I'm going to use a badge. I don't need a key. And they've forgotten the fact that, well, actually in most municipalities, the fire marshal actually requires by code to have that key to get into the building. Um, so there's a crashing of the physical and digital worlds that's occurring here. And it's really important that you do your homework and you work with partners that understand how buildings are specified, what the requirements are in your particular area, um, so that you can maximize your investment um, and understand how to get the most out of what you have. The beautiful thing about everybody that's sitting here is it, there, we're all very focused on modularity. How, how can we get you the pieces up front to make it easy for you and to give you the best possible experience? But also how can we put something in place that's a strong base for you so you can build your solution over time to suit your needs as things happen? I don't think any of us uh, thought about COVID. Um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of things that can occur and having that flexibility um, uh, and ability to um, address um, some pretty sharp turns is going to be really valuable um, for digital security professionals going forward because, again, it's going to be brackish water, it's going to be cyber, and it's going to be physical going forward. So, you know, one of the questions that came in had to do with compliance and how we sort of think about uh, being compliant across what are the whatever the standards are that are required by our organization, whether it's as, as you know, tactical as building codes or whether it's, you know, being compliant to a standard like a HIPAA or a PCI or, or, or frankly, anything else. Um, and I'd love to get your thoughts on that uh, just from across the panel. And in particular, when you think about um, the world as it's changed today, uh, now with uh, a new layer of uh, physical security threats, right? There's a lot more violence in the workplace that we have to sort of worry about. Uh, there's a lot more health standards and wellness standards that have yet to be sort of codified, but are nonetheless coming and we sort of know those are coming. And I think there's an increase in sort of vulnerabilities on the cyber level in terms of now having to provide auditable data for almost anything that's happening in the building at any real time to meet compliance standards. How do you all think about those? And, and feel free to jump in whoever wants to go for it. I can start um, just maybe starting with the basics and the physical piece. So um, people who've been in this business for a while understand access control is really about creating layers um, within the building because depending on where you are, um, it may be the cultural norm for you to hold the door for someone. And no matter how much you train, you're still going to have someone who holds the door for someone. So what's the next layer and what's the next layer after that? 
Um, so that next layer in a you know converged um, infrastructure um, could be, um, hey, they got in through the physical door, they got in through the lock, but there's a camera pointed at them. Um, there's an awareness there. There's a recognition. Hey, this person should not be here. And your ability to, and this is part of the reason why James and I talk a lot about, there's a great opportunity to move electronics from the perimeter to the interior of the building. And some of those are obviously, you know, fully integrated software solutions and some are um, maybe just smart devices that have some intelligence that can, you know, drive the right behaviors. But as we look at a seamless access um, implementation of these technologies, when you start to think about um, codes and standards, like James was talking about, you're meeting the basics, you're also starting to add in the other componentry um, that is going to be necessary in order for you to optimize um, the flow of your building, the you know, asset utilization uh, that you have to track all kinds of things, which ultimately flows, you know, towards an, you know, open path and what they do in terms of providing the type of analytics that drive productivity. So we can talk about codes and standards. We can talk about compliance. We can talk about layered security and diminishing threats. But if you're working with the right integrator and with the right partners at the same time, you're talking about how do I take all of those things and also think about them from the lens of productivity, benefit, and experience. And I think that's what you have with the panelists today. Yeah, I would, I would like to add, uh, you know, thank, thank you for bringing that up, the compliance pro, uh, issue. Uh, so we, we at the Convergent, we have the capability of providing defense in the depth architecture. Uh, and also compliance is a very sensitive topic at a high level, what we have seen is compliance is of two types. One is operational, and second one is process specific. Under under operational, we have seen uh, if we look across industrial verticals, we see NUCSIP, FERC, FIPS, HIPAA, as James mentioned, and for process specific, we have SOX, we have COBIT, etc. Right. But overall, as a system integrator, we are looking for always looking for enterprise cloud-based solution, and we have very similar, the best uh, platform which we have is from OpenPath, which provides one of the great integrations with the legacy systems, inflicts cloud support. It has a compliance engine built into it with a lot of redundancy, resiliency, you know, and most important is because of COVID-19 uh, situation, it's frictionless and touchless, right? So I'm just giving an example that this is a complete architecture what we are looking for. And we are also, uh, we, we honor uh, the company like OpenPath who also make their own hardware so that we don't have to go here and there and create more pieces into our solutions. Less the number of pieces in the solutions we offer or we bake is better for us. So OpenPath is like one stop shop for us. And then we bring Meraki for visual intelligence where I think from the IoT world, uh, the camera is the most intelligent sensor we have. It's an IoT sensor. And then how uh, quickly we can uh, learn which data to be picked up from the visual intelligence and how do we massage it with the things what OpenPath is doing is the best solution for us with the compliance built into it, right? That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, I see, I see, James, I see a couple of other questions which I feel like I'd like to jump yeah. in on. Um, so. Uh, Thank you everyone who's submitting the questions. I do like uh, making sure we're answering the things that are most interesting to you as uh, we go through the next 30 minutes. So we have a question from uh, Juan and he asked, how do you address company concerns regarding vulnerabilities when transitioning from server-based systems to cloud technology? And I guess the thing I was thinking of here or when I see this is like, what made everyone think that the server-based systems were secure in the first place? Mm -hmm. I have seen some truly scary situations when it comes to uh, the server-based uh, deployment across many customers, especially when we go back to this topic that the IT team might not even know those exist. And so the idea of like regular patching, updates, looking for CVEs and all of those things, those are core to my business at Meraki and they're core to James's business at OpenPath. And we are like 
ahead of the curve in terms of like researching and developing solutions to those. So not only is that what we do to run a cloud business, but those are things that aren't generally thought about or proactively managed when it comes to a server-based system, especially when the management of those type of uh, security updates is so painful and especially in a distributed environment. Um, it, it really is, I think, uh, easier to get to a point with a cloud-based system where you are more up-to-date and more likely to have covered known vulnerabilities with a highly distributed server-based system. Yeah, so um, there's a... Let me just add that there's a concept that you know people in the physical security space are less familiar of, which is the idea of a zero day threat. And a zero day threat means that the moment the threat infects or attacks the world, you are experiencing the zero days, the exact day that it starts, right? And so the thing about cloud based systems is one of our millions of customers will impact that zero day threat and we will mitigate it right away. And we push that mitigation out across our network. And now all the other customers are benefiting from that one customer who got hit by the zero day threat. There's no patch that has to get put out, right? There's no update that has to be done. It's just automatic. And so zero day threat mitigation is one of the huge benefits of the cloud that, you know, George does unpack for you, but it really is meaningful. It just means that you don't have to wait for everybody to get infected. You can get patient zero can basically in, in, inform everybody else and you can mitigate the impact. And that's a huge deal for a security professional who would have to otherwise go out and patch servers everywhere. Yeah, you're not, you're not on your own. And right. there was a particularly, I don't want to say favorite vulnerability in the sort of traditional camera space a few years back, but I think it sort of illustrates a point, which was it was more straightforward to update the cameras using the vulnerability than it was to use the vendor's tools to patch the vulnerability. Because with the vulnerability, you didn't need to remember the login or the password or any of the authentication parameters for the cameras. You could just like flat out upload whatever you wanted to any of them. And so you would use that to upload the patch. And this thought it's like a somewhat poetic moment of like how bad the situation had become with the traditional systems that the exploit was the best way to prevent the exploit. So. I thought that was interesting. We also have a question from Tom who says, I've been doing this for 34 years. How do you explain to the customer that cloud is better than on-premise? The first question is what happens when the network is down? Well, I'll address this in two points. I think James and uh, the rest of the, the, the panelists may want to jump in on the first point here, which is it's not that you should go cloud because it's cloud. It's like, what is the value it brings? Does it reduce your cost of ownership? Does it increase the flexibility that the technology has to meet your changing business requirements? And I think we've all lived through a year where business requirements were just wildly all over the place, depending on how we were trying to respond to the, to the current situation. And so it's a tool. It's like, don't do it because it's cool. Do it because it's going to be useful. Like one clear example of this from uh, an interaction I had with a customer in the early days of our camera is they had to pay as a physical security organization, the IT team across business unit charge of around $600,000 a year for server management and maintenance. And that didn't include the capex of getting them in the first place because as their security camera deployment was so large. And so when you say, well, there are no servers, like immediately that's a cost they no longer have to bear. So that's very significant monetary return, which can be seen from going to cloud along with some of the other benefits. Um, I'm going to see if any other panelists want to chime in here. Yeah, I can, I can add, I wanted to add a little bit here. Uh, basically, we are, as a system integrator, we are very transparent to our customers. Uh, we, we always say that, and we understand, depending upon the use case and the vertical, that everything cannot move to the cloud. Like legacy infrastructure has to stay like card readers, et cetera, have to, have, have to be on the on-premises, right? And then what type of edge connectivity challenges does that vertical is having or that customer is having? Are there any bandwidth or latency issues? Then we have a way to resolve it because cloud is very important. Cloud brings, uh, for us in the IoT world, it brings a lot of availability, a lot of resiliency, right? So, but we mitigate the problem. We understand what type of uplink connectivity is required, 5G, 4G, what is available. And then we also understand the data sensitivity. Sometimes depending upon the vertical, uh, customer doesn't want the data to go out of the premises, right? So we always take the middle path 
and we take all these things into considerations. And also last but not least, uh, when we do the ROI calculations and TCO calculations for the cloud, we make sure that customer is aware that compute for video analytics is costly. You know, and it can be costly on the premises as well as on the cloud, depending upon how much data egress is required for that use case, because data egress from the cloud will always be costly. So seeing all this, we design an architecture where customer is comfortable and he completely understands that why cloud is important and how do we move to the cloud? So if uh, the team will indulge me, I want to sort of catch the last part of Tom's point and then there's a specific question around uh, cameras, Meraki cameras from Eric, which I was going to go to next. So Tom, the last part of your question was, uh, what happens when the network is down? Well, uh, I think when we build technology, again, it's back to this idea that cloud is not there just because it's cool. It's like, we understand the network is going to go down at some point. It may not always be available. There's going to be interruptions. Someone is going to cut through your fiber line with a backhoe. Like all of this stuff happens in the real world. And so our technologies are built to be resilient and survivable. They're not designed to run completely without the cloud. Like you can't deploy them standalone and never ever connect it to the cloud, but they're designed to continue to work, provide functionality and do the things they're meant to be doing. That's what you bought them for, even when there are interruptions, because these are critical pieces of infrastructure. These are not like a nice to have sort of uh, element in your home. These are critical pieces to keeping people safe keeping assets safe and, and managing your operations. So you can't have a situation where the network going down is going to lead to a significant loss in capability of these technologies. Hey, George, uh, let me just add one thing on that. And yeah. that is, you know, an anecdote from one of our customers. Um, Post COVID, they were shutting down a number of their offices to reduce their real estate footprint. And um, one of their big offices, they realized just based on where their users are that they just didn't need it anymore. Uh, the challenge is their legacy access control system was a hub and spoke system. So they had satellite servers deployed at all their various locations, all a uh, gateway server back over a, a proprietary VPN back to their hub. And the hub office was the office that they were having to sort of get rid of. And uh, I think the challenge with uh, an on-prem system is that you can't take the system with you, so to speak. In the cloud, it's always there. Your configurations, your accounts, your users, everything's there. And if you need to lose uh, one office to you know, deploy another office, it's all still there, the software, and you can just add additional doors, add additional situations. Whereas here, they had to completely re-architect their entire access control system across the company, across multiple locations, and it was super challenging. So there's a lot of flexibility that comes, I think, with having something that's hosted centrally that sort of stays where you are as compared to proprietary on specific premises. Great, great point, James. So we have a question from Eric. Uh, we're in the process of removing our old cameras and replacing with market cameras. This typically was handled by a different department, but now that it touches the network, it's hard for the other side of the business to let go of this idea. I think this is a topic that we've been talking about. What is the best approach to handle this handing over of the security to cybersecurity, making sure it's handled properly and diplomatically? Well, let me give you my take on how we're seeing the future and how we're imagining and how we're actually developing the product to support these type of conversations, which is ultimately IT people are not the physical security experts, right? Even if this technology becomes more IT centric, they're not the ones that are trying to like prevent shoplifting, ensure staff safety and all the other type of things that you use these technologies for. They're infrastructure operators and administrators, like they are infrastructure operator administrators of servers that run business applications that help order processing, for example. They are not order processors themselves. And we see that in the uh, sort of transition of uh, physical security tools as well. And the way we have looked at that is, if you're familiar with the Maraki dashboard, the Maraki dashboard is this web-based interface for our cloud for managing all your Maraki infrastructure. And it's been developed over the last 10 years as an interface for managing primarily networking equipment, because that's what Maraki had been working on until we launched cameras and, and sensors and other non-networking uh, technologies. So is it ideally suited for police officers, security guards, teachers, like nurses in a hospital? No, it's not. And we have had that feedback and we've been listening to those users and we have developed an interface, which is for them to do their jobs the Meraki Vision Portal, and it's designed for physical security users and people who don't want to know anything about how it works, 
but want to use it to do their jobs. And it's simplified that really significantly and it's separate and it has separate role-based access control. And so you don't need to sort of have uh, this situation where like, this is mine, we're taking it from you. You're like, here, here is this thing, which is easier to use. You can look at it on your phone when you're mobile, if you want, you can use these tools to find video more easily. And you, you, you show them that part. So it's a way of helping them get to the outcomes more easily. And uh, one great example I have of this was uh, in a, a retailer in the UK where the IT team had brought us in, they were deploying Marathi cameras in these uh, uh, stores and the physical security team were skeptical. I mean, I feel that's, that's going to be the, the position, but when they started using it, what they realized was it was so easy to share video evidence of shoplifting and other issues with the police. It changed completely how they worked because the police didn't have to come to fight. They could send the footage to them remotely and then the police would be like, oh yes, we know that person. And then they would go and make an arrest of that person who they knew was a shoplift and they now had evidence for. And that created such a strong partnership between IT and the physical security team, they really trusted them to give them better tools to do their job. And then the physical security team had a really good relationship with the local police force because it made the local police force jobs easier as well. So that's focusing on the outcomes rather than like who owns what. So uh, that was a really good experience that sort of demonstrates that like approach. I think if you click on the next slide, um, we'll kind of see a little bit uh, to what George was talking about. You have to think a lot about all the different elements that combine in a physical security strategy, right? And it, the dashboard or the idea of having a single sort of command and control console that's configurable and malleable to the different user communities is super important. It's something OpenPath has built into our dashboard. I know, for instance, because Allegiance wireless locks are actually all cloud-based as well, they run off of a gateway, we were able to pull those into our dashboard so you log into a single place to control it. We were able to take Meraki's APIs and bring their video feed into our dashboard so you can see it all together. And one of the questions that was asked had a lot to do with, okay, what are the other building systems and how do you integrate those? So whether it's parking or destination dispatch or turnstiles and elevators, how do you, you know, make sure that your physical security posture across all those different domains and disciplines is consistent? And I think uh, you don't always have the benefit of having a single vendor, right? The elevator vendors, they have proprietary systems, very closed, very difficult to integrate with. You have turnstiles, which are pretty easy. It's just basically another lock. Uh, you have locking systems, right, which have different levels of, com you know, complexity associated with them, whether it's a wireless lock or a physical lock, uh, and you have to be able to connect to those, you know, door strikes, mag locks, wireless locks with an access control system. And then you've got video surveillance, right? And so uh, we think of it as who is uh, the, the user of the system and what is the goal that they're trying to achieve? Who is the uh, end? Are trying to gain what is the goal that they're trying to achieve. And if we map around user experience, both for the end user who's trying to enter and use the building safely, and the security professional who's trying to protect the building, uh, I think you end up with the optimum solution. Uh, but I'm curious, Rob, as you think about industrial design and you think about the products that you guys you know, have and how you think about it, how do you evolve uh, from you know, a lock company that is selling all these different locking mechanisms to push this into a cloud consumable uh, you know, product that can be used like, you know, George was talking about with these dynamic dashboards and such. Yeah, I, I think it's um, recognizing that there's really not a big difference between the physical and digital anymore. Accepting the fact that, hey, we have physical requirements and things like that. For example, you know, you can't knock it off with a sledgehammer. You you can't burn it, you know, off you all, all of the things you can't kick it in easily and, and those things. But also, you know, understanding that um, part of the design, part of the simplicity of it is not only, you know, is it easy to use, but how easy is it to uh, integrate? So what is the developer experience if you're working with other third parties to make what you just described, James, as a complex ecosystem a little less complex um, for people? Um, how can we make it um, more simple for people to um, understand um, how to um, how to play, but for us, it's it's really that fusion of you know most people think about software, but in the case of a of a lock, you're talking about firmware. 
Uh, what can we do in many cases at the firmware level to make it easier to um, transition a lock from one function um, to another um, easily and enhance not only the value of that product over time. You know, when you buy a product from a Legion, the first day you get it, that's as dumb as it should be. Um, it should get smarter over time. It should add capabilities and add value. You know, I just, I keep harping on this one thing, which is digital productivity. It's there for you. Um, you don't have to sacrifice that to get your security. Um, you should be able to get both. So from a design standpoint, it's it's really a, a fusion across the you know the physical elements that people are used to when they look at a lock, they look at a reader, they look at a closer, they look at any of these things. Um, but how intuitive can we make um, you know that that um, interface um, b between all the things? Because at the end of the day, the word we use is seamless access. What we're interested in doing and the reason why we're partnered with the people on the screen is because they all believe in a vision which I would describe as seamless access. How can we provide that really high level of security, um, but also give that convenience that everybody is really craving so that your employees are excited to come to work rather than kind of dreading working their way through or having a lousy guest experience? Yeah. Uh so, um, so oh, go ahead, Nadeep. Yeah, just uh, wanted to add one small point here that uh, for the sake of audience that uh, mobile and cloud, uh, mobility and cloud, what I mean, has not been disrupted much except by very few companies like OpenPath in the world of access, card reader access, right? This is what is facilitating, facilitating us in the field, right? So we always look for architecture which has redundant simultaneous uplinks to send the credentials in the northbound directions. We see in these architectures that we have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cellular, all three available. So as uh, being uh, uh, mentioned by Rob, there are there is there are a lot of there is a lot of redundancy in the architecture, right? There is touchless access, but there is mobility, cloud, re redundant uplinks. And then own hardware, and last but not least, when we deploy this hardware, we have these panels with PoE, PoE plus, right? These are some of the things which makes our life easy, and then we can easily integrate the video from Meraki, bringing visual intelligence, right? So that's where the simplicity comes, the redundancy comes. That's what I wanted to add my two cents of what you said. Thank you. I was wondering if I could sort of jump in for two minutes here, because I see a couple of questions I'm hoping to answer as, as one package. Um, they're a little more network related. So there's a question from Roberto about adaptive policy, uh, policies for uh, providing cybersecurity on like switching infrastructure. There's also a question from Nathaniel about voice over IP and how to secure uh, those on your switching infrastructure. And I thought this is interesting because there's two points that uh, I would sort of talk about. One is I walk around and I see all of these things out there in the real world. And one of the ones that always makes me smile is when there's an ethernet port on a wall that you can just walk up to and plug anything into, or just unplug the camera or the access point or the whatever it is. And you're like, I'll just see what's happening if I plug this in there. Um, implementing the, and this is like that convergence of cybersecurity and physical security is like, Someone needs to think like that's a really important switch that could turn off a critical piece of infrastructure. <laughs> like if you told the physical security people, turn that switch and all the heating in the building goes off, they might actually do something about putting it somewhere safer. So putting some protection on that, things like port security, 802.1x for authentication to make sure you can't just unplug it and plug in whatever you want is, is really important. And Nathaniel, I've seen it's, it's a bit of work, I know, but like if you really put in the effort to do 802.1x seamlessly, I've seen it at higher education colleges, it's really phenomenal, especially when the policy is not block access, it's like put you into a different level of access because you haven't authenticated or we don't trust you. So you're not ending up with like a thousand support tickets, you're just ending up with your, your stuff being protected. And Going to uh, the question from Roberto about adaptive policies and sort of things like uh, uh, secure group tagging in the network infrastructure, I think this goes to an area that sort of Navdeep has been talking about, 
it's like there's lots of different pieces of IoT technology and they're not all going to miraculously end up in the cloud. Like we're fortunate enough to represent companies really working on the cutting edge, but there's the real world of customers with lots of existing investments that aren't going anywhere, that are not going to be in the cloud anytime soon and need to be supported. And so by implementing uh, security within the network infrastructure, we can have this hybrid approach where the cloud most of those things are thought of for you, but when they're not, you can use things like secure group tagging, which enables um, layer two, essentially end-to-end -end security in the network to have those IoT things or like sensors speaking MQTT, not only protected, but also you're protected from them. And uh, I'm sure everyone is is bored of the, the story, but if you've not heard it, go Google uh, casino in London hacked through a fish tank. And then you realize how the world of IoT uh, can lead to some pretty nasty outcomes if you don't think about the security of those IoT things seriously. By the way, and George, by the way, made a killing at the casino that night. And uh, I, I was impressed. Uh, you think roulette is a game of chance, but according to George, he's very good at it. Uh, and so if we could go to the last slide here, uh, I, I did want to sort of, as we wrap up, um, uh, think about a couple of things. One, we have uh, the second of this series of great webinars uh, coming up. Uh, it'll be on July 27th, and uh, we're going to cover uh, a deeper dive into the cloud. Clearly, a lot of real uh, great questions here from uh, the crowd on uh, cloud security, and we'll be able to sort of dive in even more on the benefits there. Uh, I wanted to, you know, recap real quick and sort of have each of you kind of leave uh, sort of maybe your your your, your last thoughts. Uh, behind on, you know, what's happening with this convergence today and, and what are some sort of notable, uh, you know, advice that you might share with uh, the listeners out there. And one other quick thing is that um, everyone asked for email addresses to reach out to us directly. And so um, I don't know if I type it into the Q&A if it shows up publicly, but it's james at openstack.com for me. And um, if you guys want to type yours in, uh, if you want to make yourself uh, available, that'd be great. Uh, and so let's start with Rob. Uh, final thoughts and advice on how to keep this convergence of uh, cyber and physical going. Sure. Um, my advice would be don't be intimidated. Um, you'll be you'll see a million reasons not to do this. And the truth of the matter is, if you partner up with the right people, you're going to be just fine. The other thing is you don't have to do it all at once. Um, the best solution providers have an incremental approach that's modular in design that's going to allow you to scale over time. Um, last but not least, I would say expect more from your IoT providers. You heard me say it earlier when you get, whether it's a Schlage lock or something else that we make, um, that device should get smarter over time and it should add more value over time. So have higher expectations for what you're getting. Ask the right questions. You can ask your integrator, you can ask Navdeep, you can ask OpenPath, you can you ask George, you can ask me. We can tell you about what's around the corner and what's coming and what are we hoping to do. Um, it's obviously not something to necessarily plan on for your immediate usage, but it's always good to ask those questions and understand um, you know, what the OEMs are looking to do with their products going forward and how your integrator thinks about that in the broader ecosystem. So. You know, don't be intimidated. Um, there are better and better solutions out there, and there are plenty of really good partners that can get you going without breaking the bank um, and um, without getting you into trouble. Thanks. And Navdeep, uh, we'll go with you, and then we'll finish up with George. Thank you. Uh, so my uh, last comments are that the future lies in mixing and leveraging visual intelligence with physical and digital security and location intelligence. We should not ignore location as well. So that is the future. And we know that IoT has been around since last three to four years, but you will see that still the data remains locked inside its sources. That's why we have companies like good platforms from OpenPath where we can really plumb the data what we need and bring more intelligence to our customers. Thank you. Okay. And George, bring us home. In short, if you're in IT, go find your physical security colleagues, counterparts, or people who care about that, and go talk to them. And if you're in physical security, or you deal with facilities and elements like that, go talk to your IT team. And what you should do, 
focus on the outcome you want and I'll drive the right technology choice. Well, thanks very much, everybody. This has been a great panel, great conversation. Please, everyone, stay tuned and uh, for July 27th and I recommend your friends to join. They'll be recording this, made available so that you all get emails and be able to look back and, and, and hear all the, the great lessons. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.